I have a lot of faith when I see Sam Mendes produce productions because everything or the last few things that I've seen with his name attached have always been amazing. He's directed my favorite movie, Skyfall. He also did Penny Dreadful, the sequel series. I mean, he's done so much. I think he even had a hand in Succession at some point. But yeah, yeah. it wouldn't surprise me. So when I heard the franchise was being made, I didn't know a thing about it except for him being attached to it, that he was going to direct it. And I said, this is one that I want to see. It came out October 6th, 2024, almost five years or five years after the trailer for 1917 dropped. And then the first episode is now out on HBO. It's a witty, irreverent series that is supposed to be highlighting the dysfunction of big budget superhero productions. In a way, it's kind of like the bubble that right. that came out a few years ago. That wasn't a good movie. But because of just I think that there was a lot more put into this production. I don't know. You tell me. Well, I think that you were right with the bubble that focused on an A-list cast that had an A-list cast and director. And the story is about them having to make much a less, blockbuster much movie. Much less of a cast, though. Right. It's yeah. a condensed cast. I also had Fall Guy here, which came out in May. It's also centered around the filming of a blockbuster. It's way different than this movie, though, because that goes in a completely different direction. Well, it deals w- that deals with a stunt dude. Right. right. Yeah. And it was even made by a stunt guy, kind of like a Taylor Sheridan right. type. This is all focused on the assistant director. The only time I've ever heard of assistant directors over the last little while is I think that the assistant director is the one who in Rust got arrested or or charged along with Alec Baldwin, because despite you thinking maybe the director being in charge of all the films, um, even in this episode of the franchise at the very end, um, Hamish Patel, who plays uh, what's his name, Daniel, um, says, I'm the everything man. I'm in charge of coordinating everything everything at once and so i'm constantly tired and zonked out but i wouldn't change it for the world and this is my job and this is based on sam mendez's experience mostly with uh the james bond movies because he did skyfall and specter so he really was taking kind of taking these big franchises and wanting to make a pilot he even got armando ianucci who is the creator of veep the thick of it avenue five like so oh so avenue five was going to be one of my comparisons because it's also uh, the set in this is one of my biggest pros right because the whole production is around a production so you've probably got fake cameras being filmed by real cameras and it's probably very confusing but it looks pretty cool avenue five similar setup where you have like this giant hall for um for for this cruise ship that uh hugh laurie is walking around as captain with Daniel's kind of the captain of this ship. He was also in Avenue 5 as yeah. a character. So you want to talk about that. Billy Magnuson, who plays Adam in this, it seems like he's always playing an actor because in The Offer, he played Robert Redford, Nathan Hill, and Get Shorty. And well, I even... Get Shorty was the first thing because he played Trevor... Uh, well, what's his face? Uh, the guy from... Not to- Tobey Maguire, but the other guy. Um, the one who you always confuse with Tobey Maguire. Topher Grace. Topher Grace, Topher Grace, Topher Grace yeah. is in Get Shorty. He plays the main star there, and uh, he's like his understudy. Billy Magnuson's yep. character is the understudy. But throughout that series, he gains and becomes kind of just like the normal male straight white guy who's who's like become... Well, actually, he's not even straight in that because he ends up <laughs> yes, sucking yeah, Topher yeah. Grace's dick in the first episode. <laughs> but, uh, but you were going to mention Black Mirror, I assume. Well, no. I even saw him in Broadway in 2013 and Vanya and Sonia and Masha and Spike, where his character was a failed actor whose big achievement was him almost getting a role in entourage too so it seems like well, he's don't you remember well black known. mirror in the jesse plemons episode he was he is in that he was yeah. he was playing an actor who was <laughs> n- not as successful but he was like playing the villain in that and then i think he ends up being killed off as well so he is used to playing someone playing a character well it's funny you mentioned that because hamesh patel was also in joan is awful which was the season six premiere, I think, of Black Mirror. Along right, right, with, right. Along with Lalia Dofi, who plays Dag, the third assistant director in this. Look, everybody here has been in something. Uh, the Pat guy, the one who is like the evil villain of this series, coming in there to shut production down a yep. little bit. He is from Ozark. Aya Cash, it took me a second, but then I was like, that's Stormfront. Obviously, she's been in that other series that I, it escapes me right now, but she's she's famous for creating her own series. Uh, then Daniel Brühl, who I will always think was the best in Rush because uh, Nikki Lauda, 
uh, his performance in that was pretty incredible. He got acclaimed for that, but also he was in Civil War. He was the villain in Civil War. So he has experience on big stuff. And he's also worked with Thor, um, obviously. So they have that Marvel connection. All of these guys have probably been on some form of the sets that they're making fun of. Yes. So the cast is a pro. I would also say that the pacing is a pro because of how quick speed it is. That is what it took from 1917 and from um, uh, from the Lehman Brothers trilogy is the fact that like the first scene is one long shot right. of Hamish Patel walking around the entire set, having to coordinate between the fish people and his new assistant director um, like and and everything and yeah, everything in between and so i just think that they're who's the guy who's known for the walk and talk uh aaron sorkin aaron sorkin it's a lot of that type of newsroom type thing and in fact in the first episode of newsroom they bring in a new producer played by a love interest character right. who then um is there for the rest of the series i think that's what aya cash is supposed to be to hamish patel and I know that Sam Mendes, he even told the Russo brothers, he asked them specifically to tune in and watch because he thought that they were going to be able to enjoy this because it's supposed to be pretty accurate to how film sets uh, are. Really? But John Brown, he's the real creator for this because Sam Mendes is just the co-creator. He's ran, uh He only created one other show that came out in 2019 called Dead Pixels, but wrote for Misfits peep show exclusively and then for succession veep and avenue five so like you're saying a lot of talent behind the camera a lot of talent in front of the camera but one of my questions i want to ask the first one is is the series a criticism of superhero films or a celebration of the people on sets Uh, number one Uh, obviously it's going to be promoted as number two as well but I, i think this is just another version of like let's take an ironic uh view of the big egos that are out there the narcissistic personalities and yet because of all the money that's there and the excitement and the fact that things are it's not necessarily pc but everybody still wants to be a part of it because it's show business so you agree with the articles because it seemed like the interviews with the cast were saying this is about people below the line that like are gaining the representation they finally deserve but the article titles are crazy for this thing so indiewire the franchise is an unrelenting evisceration of cinematic universes av club the franchise kicks off by kicking superhero movies in the crotch the new york times a franchise review cutting marvel down to size den of geek the franchise review biting hbo comedy ass where it all went wrong for superhero films chicago tribune hbo's comedy skewers the movie business the daily beast hbo's news comedy brutally skewers marvel superhero movies the thing about marvel though is it's not really when i'm watching this film being made it looks like they have scrolls yes but it also looks more like star trek than it does marvel to me um i i get the connection because that's the most recent and it's the biggest for sure but this didn't feel like it was an attack on one studio it felt like it was more just like an overwhelming opinion about all franchise stuff the pat character reminds me of what hbo went through in that they hired a new ceo to really gut them right and to make sure that they like uh perf- that he didn't really care about cutting loose bait or or even things that were successful. You know, he just wanted to he just cared about the bottom. Was line. that the reason that Westworld was canceled? It may have been part of the reason why Westworld is canceled. I think the majority of what why Westworld was canceled is because of what Westworld became. Um, but again, I don't think that the article saying that it was directed only at Marvel are being fair. Uh And I also think that people judging the show based on one episode, if I've learned anything from Sam Mendes, it's that like he has a direction he wants to go. There's going to be some kicker at the end of this, not a twist, more just like it's going to come to a conclusion where you're like, wow, that whole thing was a, a presentation. It wasn't just about any specific episode so it is like 1917 in a way because 1917 doesn't have a twist but definitely at the end of that film yeah you're Lehman left Brothers, with like same thing like yeah. you get a bunch of little stories in between but overall the trajectory of the story is it's it's important so that's why every episode of this show this first one called scene 31 a tecto meets i everyone is a different scene Right. By the end we're going to get a full picture of what this story is and hopefully feel like because I'll be honest, like, I don't think that this was much better than a 7.5 out of 10. And that's me being generous. 
I like the pacing. I like the one shot take. I think if you rewatch it, you end up getting catching a lot more jokes and, and a lot of uh, off the cuff cliche or non cliche things that, that you can attach to. Hamish Patel, I think he did a good job steering this thing. The actors as a whole are, are, are good. But oh, but but there are things to criticize. For, right. For instance, I don't think it's the funniest show out there. I, in fact, I think the Charlie Puth show was funnier <laughs> than this. Um, and and uh, the best joke, what would you say? The best joke? Uh, I agree with AB Club where I, I'm not sure if it's a joke, but the ending scene where you kind of understand where Hamish Patel is coming from after he talks about the story kind of about how um, like I don't he, know if you're supposed to side with him with it there or if you're supposed to side with Dad. I thought that it defined his character the most right. out of any other character in the show that he's insane yes <laughs> yeah, but no. i mean that's to be fair that is what an assistant director even from the few college shorts that i did when i was in film that's kind of how you're supposed to look at it like you're supposed yeah. to be juggling too many things murphy's law is the only way to do it in film you have to take it in stride you can't ever let yourself get overwhelmed even when he finds out the production is on fire actually he, he my favorite he didn't look that freaked out by it my favorite joke was probably like a scene Billy Magnuson with the lights because I, think I know Billy Magnuson is a perfect fit for those this yeah, those absolutely. lights are hot they are they are incredibly hot just to and the so touch he sets up right in front of them for a tan or yes. the, what was it yeah yeah I think he was looking for a tan and instead he bleaches his eyes <laughs> yeah. um I think that uh the best joke to me was probably the sleep pillow where it, because it's such a busy cluster set that you get sleep where you can and the idea of having to wrap your your head into a pillow seems nice but you can't breathe then and so it has a cutout where your nose and your mouth is it's like those airport pillows that you get where they go around your neck but instead it's around your entire face it also reminds me of like er rooms where there, there's a place designated for doctors to sleep yes. right it also <laughs> reminds me though of the penguin how you were talking about how colin farrell got extremely hot in yes, his costume right. you could yeah. not survive in that sleep <laughs> pillow very long before it would just uh yeah you would be sweating like crazy i also liked when justin got fired because the producer was supposed to come to bat for the director and when pat came in there to kind of kill off a lot of the unnecessary stuff in production um justin was supposed to like stop him and instead he just gets fired immediately allowing the aya or aya um cash or anita to come in there and take over the other stuff is is less funny, more cliche. You've got golf carts around the studio, eccentric actors, egos, oddball director. Uh, the d bigger the production, it seems like the better the catering. So even though everything's a mess, the catering's great. <laughs> it seems like that's always the case, though, right? Because like things with Mink, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the disaster artist may be a little bit of a different story, but the Fablemans, they all follow that same like kind of stereotypical characters, huge productions about movies that either were made or are supposed to remind, of, remind us of other ones. And that's why I felt like the idea personally just wasn't that new. Yeah, the soul of it has kind of been used up in other things. It right. would be nice to have a little bit more, not hard in like an Abbott Elementary, like, oh, everything has to come together, but more maybe smart. Right. Um, and that's where I'm not giving up on the show because I think Sam Mendes wouldn't have attached himself to this unless there is some of that coming along. Uh, the other shows I would compare it to is Flack because that was about the production of, I think, a, um, a 30 Rock type thing. Um, that was like a news network, I think, right? Yeah, it might have been. Yeah. Well, I thought it, it might have been a news network. Yeah, Get Shorty, Barry, um, Tropic Thunder, uh, supernatural <laughs> when they got transported into the changing channels yeah um, changing yeah. channels episode and then peacemaker because our main character who we start with dag she literally just doesn't do anything we talk about this at the beginning of the show except in the very ending scene everybody got their own definition as a character except for her she kind of just existed as a fly or uh, less of a fly on the wall more just invisibly um and then I will point out my other flaw here says that uh, bathroom scene. What I mean by that <laughs> is that um, I had never gone into a public restroom and had a conversation with someone. Especially to stall right next to you. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's always the joke. But I honestly, I think the most I've, you try to get out of there as quick as possible. You never have an interaction with anybody, especially your enemy, right? <laughs> Yeah. And it might be different for, for girls. I don't want to be like too cliche, but they sometimes will go to the bathroom together and make a visit of it because they're, they'll maybe be 
like I don't know, right, yeah, their yeah, makeup yeah. or something. But with with guys that usually it's like if you're in a urinal, you try to just get out of there. They have a full conversation. Pat is intimidating Daniel. Then Justin arrives. Pat shakes his hand without washing it, and then he leaves, which I think was genius as far as defining his character again. But like the only time that I found that as an effective, like, oh, this is realistic, was when in industry, in that ep- in that pilot episode, the new guy walks in, and you got to remember the whole point of that show is kind of like everybody is it's a cut shark or it's a shark world where like everybody's trying to back doggy down dog each other. yeah yeah and so he walks in there as the new intern and there's some weird guy he's like an, the, one of the old guys and he has his trousers all the way down around his ankles and i think so, he's just doing that as like as like a scare tactic to the like it's almost like a hazing thing for the new people um a, that he or that he just doesn't give a fuck i thought that was a really funny scene because it didn't require too much conversation in it but the whole thing of like let's stop having scenes where the lawyers meet in the bathroom or like where where you're getting intimidated in a bathroom cuz or the after party did it too i think right yeah no. it just seems like it's overdone I so before we get into the actual reviews, I wanted to see if you could name the above the line positions because there's four that pe- four positions people generally talk about when they say above the line, um, in terms of film sets, and they're pretty basic. Like they're the they're the most paid jobs. They're the ones that people kind of fight after. I wanted to see if you could guess any of them. The highest paid is just going to be actors, directors, screenwriters, and what was it? it wouldn't be it. Producer don't count, right? No, producer does count. Okay, producer. So, yeah, you got all four of them. I was going to give you a pass, say that three was you, uh, but you were able to achieve all of them. Yeah, and then below the line are well, kind it's of... Well, with producers, you can get a production credit for actually, like, what Justin's... Where you're actually doing a job, and then sometimes it's just an obligatory thing. Yes. So, I feel like the obligatory ones don't come with as much money. Well, there's also even assistance for, like, producers, and exactly directors, producers and actors. And they stuff, yeah. they technically fall above the line, but really below the line is everyone else. Gaffers, editors, hair and makeup, kind of all the different things. But the reception for the show has been kind of mixed. It has a 6.1 on IMDb, IMDb, 69% on Rotten Tomatoes. And the AV Club gave it a mostly uh, positive thing, but they said that they felt the series is behind about five years and maybe would have benefited from coming out around the time of WandaVision in like 2021 really when it seemed like I think like... it's behind Get Shorty like if it had come out before Get Shorty that's the line and that came out like what 10 years ago really like I yeah. don't yeah. so you think so you think that it's really behind the times if I was just judging it by this first episode and I wasn't taking into account that it has a great director behind it I would say it's taking the same ideas and throwing them out there as if they're new that said, I think if you rewatch this episode in the future, like you're going to catch a lot more things than you thought, kind of like with Veep. Um, yeah. And so I think there are jokes there. That they, you, they're just not like the laugh out loud, gotcha in that moment type joke. They, they don't wait for you. I think it's more so it's situ- very British humor. Situational, yeah, because Sam Mendes talked about how he just wanted to put the audience in the middle of it, not explain kind of anything that was really going on and just make the audience decide if they were going to keep watching or not. And I think that when you go with that, you're going to get kind of a polarized response. Some people are going to like it because you're not spending too much time on things because I know you complimented the pacing. Other places are going to be like Rolling Stones where they say they said, I came out of the franchise lamenting the fact that such a great collection of actors and producers were involved in a show that's not nearly as funny as it should be right that was my biggest con is it's not funny not yet but but wait but yeah so so i I have i have hope for it um anything else no that's about it thanks for listening we'll see you on the next episode hope you enjoyed this one bye bye